Today we are asking the question, is there light at the end of the tunnel? And you heard about uh, the, the, the Bible passage being read there, spoke, spoke about Abram. Now, Abram, I'm just going to call him Abraham because uh, God changes his name to Abraham. And that's the, the kind of name we're familiar with. So even though his name hasn't changed yet, that's what I'm going to go with. And you might have grown up uh, singing a song. Maybe you were a, a Sunday school goer. And you might have uh, sung that song. Father Abraham had many sons. Many sons has Father Abraham. I am one of them and so are you. <laughs> Never really knew what they said after that. But anyway, um, well-known uh, classic from Sunday school. Now, what on earth is that song about? If you just think about it. Why are we singing about Father Abraham and have him having many sons. Well, hopefully today from Genesis 12, we might just see that we are children of Abraham. Now, if you've been with us in the series we've been, we've been in, Reset, uh, in Genesis, uh, we've worked our way all the way from Genesis chapter 1 to Genesis chapter 11. And... Uh, there, there is a very big shift from Genesis chapter 12 going forwards. Uh, after the Tower of Babel and the disaster that happened there, uh, God begins a completely new drama uh, in the Bible. Uh, there's a, new, a whole new movement in the drama of redemption. Uh, one scholar writes that there are two parts to the Bible. What comes before Genesis chapter 12, and then everything else. And so this is a very, very important chapter. In fact, Genesis chapter 1 to 11 are actually kind of seen on their own. And then Genesis chapter 12 to the end of Genesis chapter 50 uh, is kind of seen as its own portion as well. And that is because we're introduced to Abraham, massive figure in God's story of redemption. Now, what we are going to see in particular today is a promise that God's, God makes to Abraham. Okay, And this promise, Abraham does not live to see fulfilled. And that is because the promise was bigger than Abraham. It was bigger than Abraham could have ever imagined. And as a Christian, this side of history... We read the Old Testament differently to a Jewish person living long ago would have. That's because we, we have the, the benefit of the New Testament and we live this side of Jesus. So we read the Old Testament with a lens on. We read it with the lens of Christ, with the lens of Jesus and what he has done. And that is actually something the New Testament tells us about. A very important verse in the New Testament is from 2 Corinthians chapter 1. And here the, the Apostle Paul, the writer, says this. For no matter how many promises God made, they are yes in Christ. No matter how many promises God made, they are yes in Christ. In other words, Jesus fulfills all the promises that God has made to God's people in the Old Testament and onwards. So why don't we pray as we come to this huge chapter of the Bible. Let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that no matter how many promises you have made, no matter how long ago those promises were made, that they are yes in Jesus. That they are answered and fulfilled in the person of of Jesus. We thank you that we live with the knowledge of Jesus and with the knowledge of what he has done and fulfilled. It is a great privilege to have the scriptures, to have the New Testament, and to look back on your glorious drama of redemption. So Holy Spirit, we come, we ask that you would come and 
and be with us this morning. Would you open our eyes to see something new? Would you open our eyes to see you freshly? And so that we might be transformed to be more like your son, Jesus. And we pray this in his precious name. Amen. Amen. Right, so we're going to do something a little bit different today. I just have one point to make, and then we'll apply, we'll apply it as we go. Nick's very, very happy. He says he can remember it today because there's only one. Yeah, here it is. Roy, are you ready? Through Abraham's son, God achieved his great plan. Through Abraham's son, God achieved his great plan. Now, we started the series in Genesis, Reset. Uh, we started the Reset series back on the 14th of March, Sunday, the 14th of March this year. So it's been over five months. Well done. We've been plowing on through this amazing first book of the Bible. And I'm sure you'll agree with me in saying it has been uh, challenging, as Nick mentioned earlier, but it's also been really Really good, a great blessing to many people. And um, if, you, if you've been following us and if you were here for last week, you, you would know that Genesis chapter 1 to 11 does not leave you with, with much confidence in humanity. Um, and you might have even noticed a very real pattern emerging, even if you haven't quantified it. So here it is. I'm going to quantify the pattern that has emerged so far in Genesis chapter 1 through 11. This is the pattern. Merciful warning, followed by judgment, followed by grace. Merciful warning, followed by judgment, followed by grace. And then there's a new movement in the drama. And then there's another merciful warning, another judgment, and then more grace. And then a new movement, and then another merciful warning, and then another judgment, and then more grace. That is the pattern. Now let me just show you how we've seen that. So Adam and Eve, they are mercifully warned not to eat the, tree from, the fruit from one tree in the garden. They're welcome to eat any fruit from any tree except one, a tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And the warning is, if you eat from that tree, you will surely die. Well, we know the story. They rebel against God. They do not obey that command. And they are judged as a result. Death breaks into reality, and they're banished from Eden. But God doesn't leave them. God remains um, to pursue them. He blesses them with children. And the story continues. There's a new movement. They have, his, they have two sons, Cain and Abel. And there is a merciful warning for Cain. Sin is crouching at your door. Beware. Don't kill your brother Abel. But Cain rebels, turns his back on God's merciful warning. He kills his brother and judgment follows. Cain is banished and... Uh, he will be a wanderer uh, from then onwards. But God in his grace spares Cain's life and he marks Cain in such a way so that others will spare his life as well. You see the pattern going on and the same thing happens with Noah. There's a merciful warning. The flood is coming. And Noah preaches that the flood is coming as he takes 70 odd years to build the ark. And people do not repent. The flood comes. Um, but in his grace and mercy, God saves Noah and his family. That is the pattern that we have seen uh, going through Genesis 1 through 11. And now, that's not a very happy story. And so we're asking, is there light at the end of the tunnel? Well, let's read verse 2 and 3 again, which was read just now. That's really the heart of this passage. It is the, the promise, the covenant God makes with Abraham. Here it goes, verse 2 to 3. I will make you a great nation, 
God speaking to Abraham. I will make you a great nation and I will bless you. I will make your name great and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and curse those who curse you. And all the peoples on earth will be blessed through you. So what we see here is a covenant. Now the concept of a covenant is not unique to the Bible. It was very much part of the ancient Near Eastern culture. Uh, we would probably just refer to it as a promise. But it's, it's got real depth to it. And there's lots of meaning to it. And there were, there were different uh, ceremonies often attached to making covenants. But if you're not familiar with this word, this is simply what it is. It has the simplest definition I could find. A covenant is an elected relationship of obligation under oath. In other words, it always involves a relationship. So you need at least two people. It includes binding obligations. And those obligations are sealed under oath. Okay. So the relationship involved in this covenant is the relationship between God and Abraham. Or more, more particularly God and, and Abraham's family. Everyone who would come from Abraham's line. The binding obligations are stated in the form of, a, of an oath. In a nutshell... God oaths or promises to make Abraham into a great nation. He promises to bless him. And he promises to bless all people of the earth through Abraham. Now God himself has bound himself to these obligations. And usually, not always, but usually in a covenant, there would then be obligations from the other party involved, from the other person. But that is not what we see here. If you ask yourself, what does Abraham have to do? Nothing. There isn't anything binding on Abraham. God makes the covenant with him and he will do what he will do. He will fulfill his promises and he alone will do it. Now, if you just read through what God says to Abraham, it sounds very nice on the surface. Abraham's going to be blessed, and he's going to be made into a great nation. Uh, and even all the earth will be blessed through him. But let's just get real. If you were listening when Nick read, you would have heard about Abraham's current reality. He is 75 years old, and he does not have any children. I mean, is God really serious? If Abraham is already old, and he has no children, how is he ever going to be a great nation? And God says, all the peoples of the earth will be blessed through you. Well, this doesn't seem remotely possible either. So how on earth is God going to keep this promise? How is he going to achieve this great plan? Well, if you keep reading Genesis, some of you will know the story. God does eventually give Abraham the son he promises, Isaac. And then Isaac has a son named Jacob. Jacob, Jacob goes on to have 12 sons. And those 12 sons become the heads of the tribes that will one day be the nation of Israel. So just three generations after Abraham, we have the birth of the nation of Israel. God's chosen people. And the rest of the Old Testament follows the story of the nation of Israel. Uh, Exodus, the next book in the Bible, will will show how the nation rapidly grows in Egypt. And then obviously, as the name uh, suggests, they leave Egypt. There is the great exodus. And they're heading for the land of Canaan, the promised land that God promised to give Abraham. 
Eventually there, there is a kingdom established. Firstly under Saul, but then secondly under the great king of Israel, David. And David is a direct descendant of who? Abraham. And this pattern established in Genesis 1 to 11 that we've seen, merciful warning, judgment, and grace continues. There are many warnings, many judgments, and again and again, God's, God pours out his grace on his people, Israel. And then towards the end of the Old Testament, uh, the mighty emperor of, empire of Babylon invades the southern kingdom of Judea, they conquer Jerusalem, and they destroy the city and especially the temple. And that's what the, the zeal youth are, are lo- kind of looking at in the story of Daniel. And the Old Testament ends with those exiles, those people that are carried away to Babylon like Daniel was. It ends with the stories of those who return to the promised land. They return to Jerusalem, the ruined city, and they begin to rebuild the temple. And if you have been a faithful Israelite, if you have remembered and memorized the promises made to Abraham from your Hebrew Bible, if you know this covenant, this central covenant, in the story of redemption in Genesis chapter 12, if you've kept it in your heart and you've been crying out to God to answer it, you would be left wondering as you stand in the rubble of Jerusalem, how is God going to bless the nations through us? Has the word of God failed? And you will be left wondering for quite some time. Because 400 years go by with no prophet to bring God's word to God's people. There is no word of hope. No word of the promise. No reminder for the people. And that one blank page in your Bible that separates the Old Testament from the New Testament represents four Hundred years of silence. But then the silence is broken. And what does the first line of the New Testament say? Matthew chapter 1, verse 1. It should come up on the screen for you. This is how the silence is broken. This is the genealogy of Jesus the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. And verse 2 continues, Abraham was the father of Isaac. Isaac was the father of Jacob. And all the way down through the generations, And so verse 16, where we meet Joseph, the husband of Mary. And Mary was the mother of Jesus, who is called the Messiah. This is the way God planned to bless the nations. This is the way God had planned to bless the nations through Abraham. That one day Jesus would come. One day a son of Abraham would come. Not Isaac, whom Abraham and Sarah expected. But long after Isaac, Jesus the Christ would come. And he would come to live the life that we could never live. And die the death that we deserved to die for our constant rebellion. And by dying and rising again, Jesus defeated the power of sin and conquered the devil and the curse of death that had endured ever since Adam and Eve broke that first command. 
And therefore, Jesus can say to you today, I am the resurrection and the life. And anyone who believes in me will live, even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. See, Jesus holds our eternal life to all who will believe in him. And as we saw last week, God's vision was always to gather many people from many tribes and nations and languages and people groups into his kingdom. Jesus was the way that God would bless the nations. Through Abraham, many, many, many generations later, God would answer and fulfill his promise to bless the nations. What greater blessing is there than eternal life and the life that Jesus, the son of Abraham, holds out to all of us? Galatians chapter 3, the Apostle Paul writes again, and he says this, Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. Understand then that those who have faith are children of Abraham. That is how we are children of Abraham. Father Abraham did have many sons and many daughters, And I am one of them, and so are you if you believe in Jesus. If you have faith like Abraham had. If you trust that God will fulfill his promises. And if you trust the salvation that Jesus holds out to you. Isn't the Bible an amazing story? We are heirs of the promise The promise made all those thousands of years ago to Abraham. You and I can be heirs, inheritors of that promise. And we reap the benefits, the rewards, the blessing that God promised to the nations. We form part of those nations when we trust in Jesus. And we fulfill those promises as part of those who are blessed Through Abraham's son, Jesus Christ. Now that was the the big thing I really wanted you to see and trust and cherish this morning. But there's also, that's kind of the, the macro vision of where the Bible is going, of where this passage is pointing. But there's also a lot to apply from this passage. And so I want to take some time now to look at five points of application, five things we can apply and learn from Abraham and learn from his life. And here's the first one. Joining God's mission is costly. The little passage we read, Genesis 12, chapter 1, starts like this. The Lord had said to Abraham, go from your country your people, and your father's household to the land that I will show you. Now we have to just pause there for a moment and consider what God is saying. Consider what God is asking Abraham to do here. Go from your country, go from your people, leave your father's household, and go to a land that I will show you. It is a terrifying ask. Leave your country. Leave your people. Leave your father's household. God were speaking this to us. He might say, leave South Africa. Leave your community. Your everything you know here. Leave your immediate family. Just think about what's being asked there for a moment. Let it sink in. It's like God rocks up at your door later today and says, pack up, pack up your things. Leave South Africa, leave Belito, 
Leave all your mates and, and all the familiarity that you know here. Leave your family, your immediate family, your parents, your siblings. Pack everything up and go. And you go, you ask, well, where do I need to go? God says, go. I will show you where you need to go. You don't even know where you're going. It's a hard ask. Now remember, Abraham is not a robot. He's a, a human being like you and I, with feelings. He would have had all the same concerns that we have. What will this new place be like? Who, who are the people there? Is it even safe to go? What are the financial implications of the move? What are the implications for my job and for my, my children and, and schools and and all these things. It's a radical ask. And look at what Abraham does. See, we read it as if it's a story, but it's real. And this is what he did. And it's mind-blowing. Verse 4. So Abraham went as the Lord had told him. Lot went with him. That's his nephew. Abraham was 75 years old. He wasn't in the prime of life, looking forward to a long career where he sets up shop. Abraham was 75 years old when he set out from Haran. He took his wife, Sarai, or Sarah, his nephew Lot, all the possessions they had accumulated, and the people they had acquired in Haran, and they set out for the land of Canaan, and they arrive there. Abraham packs it up and leaves. He obeys God at great cost, and he joins the mission. Joining the mission of God is costly. It's the first one. The second one, when God speaks, he moves us to join his mission. <clears throat> As I've been speaking there, you might be asking yourself, why is it that these people in the Bible are able to obey God in the face of seemingly insurmountable odds? Now, when these obstacles are so big in front of them, they are able to obey God. So Abraham leaves everything behind, everything he knows, and goes to a completely new country. And as you read the Bible, and if you know a bit about Christian history, you might ask the question again, why is it that so many people in the Bible and, and even in Christian history are able to obey God in the face of huge obstacles? Why is it that they are able to join the mission? Well, here is the main reason, I think. When God shows up, people obey Him. When God shows up for real, you are ready to obey him. See, the whole passage begins with Abraham having an encounter with God. And God speaks to him. See, when God speaks, you obey him. I came up with this as a kind of summary. The probability, it's like a one-liner. Here it is. The probability of you obeying a command is directly proportional to the authority of the one giving the command. Here it is. Again, the probability of you obeying a command is directly proportional to the authority of the one giving the command. See, if I showed up at your door tomorrow morning and I said, go to Afghanistan next week, everything going on in Afghanistan, it's frightening. I show up and say, go to Afghanistan next week. There's a very special purpose behind the move. You can trust me, but you need to go. I'm guessing most of you would laugh at me and shut the door in my face. But if a higher authority figure arrived at your door, 
you know, I was, I was trying to, it's difficult in the world today, I was trying to think of like a really respected leader. <laughs> Couldn't think of anyone. Trump. <laughs> but um, think, of, think of some president or, or someone like that. They show up at your door and they say, you've been chosen. You need to go to Afghanistan next week. Pack up. Get ready. Now that changes things. It's diff- different to me rocking up and saying go. If some important person rocks up and says, pack up, get ready. You have been chosen for a very special purpose. You need to go to Afghanistan next week. You would ac- at least consider the possibility. You would have some questions and you would consider it. You see what I'm doing here. Now the God of the universe shows up in all his glory. He shows up at your house and says, you will go to Afghanistan next week. I have a very special purpose for you prepared. Trust me, pack up and go. You would go. You would be like Abraham and go. Because when you see God in his glory and you experience the authority of his speech speaking to you, you will obey. See, when you meet God for real, he shatters all of your consumerism, all of your selfishness. All of your plans, when you meet God for real, He shatters all of those tendencies. You see, all of Abraham, like I said again, he was a normal guy. He had dreams of a comfortable life, a life of security and leisure in Haran, where he was. And all of those dreams and desires were shattered the moment he met God. And they were nothing in comparison to what he saw. Because he had met God and God had spoken to him. And it was easy to follow him. Was it a big ask? Yes, it was a big ask on Abraham. But was it easy to obey? I think it was an easy to obey because he had seen God's glory and heard him speak to him. God showed up. And when God shows up and speaks to us, he moves us to join the mission. The third one is that God will complete his mission in his own time. As we've seen, Abraham was 75 years old when he was called and when he received this promise that he would be made into a great nation. In other words, he'd have children. Well, he only had his son Isaac when he was 100 years old. That's a 25-year wait. And if you know the in-between, you know that after 10 years of waiting, Abraham and his wife Sarah couldn't wait any longer. And they made their own plan. Sarah told Abraham to sleep with her servant Hagar. And Abraham and Hagar had a son named Ishmael. But Ishmael was not the son of the promise. He was their own plan to try and achieve the promise in their own time. And so they had to wait another 15 years to receive Isaac, the son that God had promised them. Now by that stage, you can pick up the story in Genesis 18 if you want to read it. It tells us that Sarah had been through menopause. She was physically incapable of having children. But God had made a promise. And it seems that when God wants to do something big, 
He chooses the most difficult, the most roundabout, sometimes the most impossible ways to do it. And he will get it done. Why does God work like this? Why doesn't he, doesn't, doesn't he just go, oh, Abraham's done this, you know, made this side project with, with Hagar and they've had Ishmael. I'll just, I'll just use him. Why doesn't God do that? Well, it's because God doesn't have any plan Bs. God had made a promise to Abraham. He had a plan, one plan, as we've seen, to bless the nations through Jesus. And God was going to do it his way. The plan was not to use a young, fertile Egyptian woman named Hagar. The plan was to give Sarah an old, infertile granny a child. And in Genesis 18, God visits Abraham again and he says, within the next year, you will have a son. And Sarah was listening in. And when she heard this, she laughed to herself. It says this in, in chapter 18. She laughed to herself as she thought, after I'm worn out and my Lord Abraham is old, will I now have this pleasure? And God responds by saying, is anything too hard for the Lord? In other words, Sarah, how dare you laugh at me? How dare you? I said a word and the universe was formed. You think I can't give you a child? Is anything too hard for the Lord? And I think God often does things in a difficult and roundabout way because he wants to take agency away from us. He wants to show us that he will do what he will do. And he will do it in his time. And nothing is too difficult for him. And we are left saying, truly, God has done this thing. And truly, I can do nothing. I think that's why God works like this. Because he calls us to trust his promises regardless of how likely or impossible it seems that he will achieve them. Remember, our feelings and our circumstances are a false guide. But God's promises are an anchor for our soul. And they are a guide to trust. God is not subject to our plans. And his timing is perfect. Now I know in particular this point might strike home with some of you who are desperately trying to cling to the promises of God. That you've been, you've been waiting for God to answer a prayer. You've been waiting for God to come through for you. Some of you have been waiting for a long time. And I hope that as you hear this, I hope that the Holy Spirit, even now, strengthens your heart and gives you a renewed endurance to keep trusting the promises of God and keep trusting God's timing and resist the temptation to make your own way. Because going our way is no way at all. Fourthly, God blesses you to be a blessing to his mission. We're almost there, folks. Have a look at the covenant again. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. And all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. Now, blessing, as we know, is a big word in Christian culture. So why does God bless Abraham? What can we learn? Is it because he likes him? Does he favor Abraham more than everyone else? Is it because Abraham has just been such a good guy, such a nice guy, so he deserves to be blessed? 
Why is it that Abraham is blessed? Well, the covenant itself seems to suggest for no other reason that he will be a blessing to others. Do you see that? End of verse 2, beginning of verse 3. And you will be a blessing. And all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. We saw that the long-term plan was always for God to bless the nations through Abraham's son. Not Isaac, but Jesus. Now God may have blessed you. He may have blessed you with certain gifts, whether they are practical gifts or um, maybe it's gifts of time and flexibility. Maybe it's simply financial blessing. Whatever it is you've been blessed with, it isn't to make yourself more popular or to enjoy a better lifestyle um, or to retire early. God has blessed you with whatever, in whichever way he's blessed you, so that you can be a blessing to others. Abraham's blessing was not for himself. It wasn't so that he would have a good life. In fact, Abraham hardly saw what the blessing would look like. Abraham was blessed so that ultimately he would be a blessing to the nations. And that was fulfilled in Jesus. So in other words, God has blessed you in certain ways. And God has blessed you in those ways, not for yourself, not for your own self-indulgence, but that so you might be a blessing to others. So why don't you do a little litmus test this morning and ask yourself, are others, are other people enjoying the benefits of my blessing, what God has blessed me with? Are others blessed because of my blessing? Remember, whatever gifts you have in whatever form, they are from Jesus and they are ultimately for Jesus. You have been blessed so that you might bless others. And maybe it's time to take stock, get serious about what God has blessed you with and ask him, how might I use these blessings to bless others? Consider that. Lastly, as we close, the goal of the mission is worship. The goal of the mission is worship. Now, In this passage, there's a clue that reveals what Abraham is like. See, when he gets to that big tree in Shechem, in verse 7, it says, Abraham built an altar there to the Lord who appeared to him. And then in verse 8, it shows from there he went onwards to the hills east of Bethel and pitched his tent with Bethel in the west and I on the east. And there he built an altar to the Lord and called on the name of the Lord. Abraham was not a perfect man. But he has got the main thing right. He is a worshiper. And whatever he does, worship is central. See, wherever he goes, you see him building these altars. That was the, the way that people worshipped in those days. It showed that their lives were subject to the Lord Almighty. And so Abraham builds altars. He is a worshipping man. The goal of mission is worship. The goal of Christchurch North Coast is not to see more bums on seats. It is to see more people transformed by Jesus for lives of purpose. We could even say lives of worship. The goal is not ultimately to feed the poor or heal the sick or uh, bring world peace. The goal is worship. The goal is to see the vision of Revelation chapter 7 
fulfilled. Where all the nations are gathered around Jesus' throne, worshipping him. It is to see more people become worshippers of Jesus. And this is why we must count the cost and join God's mission. It is why we want to encounter God as he speaks to us in his word. It is why we want to persevere and trust that God will fulfill his promises in his time. It's also why we want to channel our resources and whatever we have been blessed with so that we might be a blessing to others. The great goal is worship. May Jesus, the lamb who was slain, receive the reward of his suffering. This is the end to which Genesis 12 points us. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your scriptures. We thank you for the drama of redemption that unfolds in a fresh way from Genesis chapter 12 and points ahead to the coming of your son Jesus who would die in our place as a substitute for us so that we might be reconciled to you. Lord, it is an incredible, incredible story that you have put together. Not for the sake of a nice story, but for the sake of your name. That your name might be hallowed, might be worshipped, might be lifted up in the hearts of all people. And so this morning, Lord, we ask that you would do in us what needs to be done. That we would join your mission. That we would hear you speak and be convicted and obey. That we would use the resources that you've given us to bless others. And we would work hard at seeing more people transformed to be worshippers of you. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen.